You're recognized for five minutes. We'll come back to him. I'm pleased uh, now to recognize, thank her for her service, the gentlelady from Texas, Ms. Escobar, you're recognized. Thank you, Madam Chair, for holding this very important hearing into the recent practices of the Bureau of Prisons around addressing the needs of inmates during the COVID-19 pandemic and the Bureau of Prisons compliance with the First Step Act. I do wanna echo um, my gratitude, not just for all the panelists, but especially for Ms. Levy as Mr. Cicilline just pointed out. It, um, I'm so grateful that you are here sharing your story with all of America. Thank you. Our prison system has long failed to recognize the dignity of incarcerated people, the majority of whom are black and brown. This morning, we heard the minority witness and our friends on the other side of the aisle lamenting the treatment of those incarcerated for the January 6th terrorist attack against our country. Mr. Jordan mentioned that he is, quote, concerned about compassion and due process. And I'm, I'm so glad to hear that. Um, the minority witness and my Republican colleagues' concerns include uh, a list of things, a delay in hearings, their belief that there is a lack of due process, claims of abuse, and the fact that some of the individuals they are fighting for don't have a criminal record or their charges are misdemeanors. I want to just note here that the concerns that they've articulated are exactly the same concerns many of us have been expressing about migrants in ICE custody. Lack of due process, claims of abuse, lack of a prior criminal record, and lengthy incarceration on civil charges. It is truly my hope that their concern about compassion and due process will be extended to the migrant population in our custody as well, one day, I hope. In spring and summer 2020, when a majority of Americans were working and learning from home to avoid spreading or contracting coronavirus, prisons and ICE facilities were the site of rapid unmitigated spread among staff and those incarcerated. And unfortunately, instead of embracing the allowances the CARES Act made for home confinement, confinement, many Bureau of Prisons facilities attempted to contain the spread of COVID-19 with lockdowns and heavy reliance on solitary confinement, a psychologically harmful tactic that prisons have historically employed as punishment. And those decisions cost lives, not just the, the lives of 277 incarcerated people, but the lives of seven staff members as well. So again, Madam Chair, thank you for this opportunity to discuss how Congress can act and how we can do better in our country. Mr. Venters, in your um, statement, you mentioned that your investigations have not just included the Bureau of Prisons, but you mentioned that your investigations have covered ICE detention facilities as well. Do you see similar problems within ICE detention as you have within the Bureau of Prisons? Lack of oversight, the need for independent health authority, et cetera? Yes, I think that in the micro sense, some of the same failings about uh, finding and protecting high-risk people are apparent, but the larger problem, the problem that will persist unless we address it, is that there is no independent oversight of the quality of health care in these settings, and we must have that. Otherwise, we're going to get the same outcomes, preventable deaths, over and over. You're absolutely right. Um, you know, I'll, I'll give you a, just a quick example of the, the desperate need for that independent healthcare oversight, not just during COVID, but preceding COVID. Um, one example is um, that we had a number of uh, ICE detainees in the El Paso facility who went on a hunger strike. And then um, as their health deteriorated, the same doctor that was overseeing their care um, then ordered that they be force-fed, tied down and force-fed um, uh, against their will. And then it was that same physician who was given the authority to, to uh, check on their health even after the force-feeding and after the, the decline in, in, in their mental health as well. There, I called for an independent review, independent oversight, um, and that is really critical. Can you articulate why across the board in detention, we need that independence? 
Certainly. I mean, we accept this as a core requirement in every other aspect of healthcare in the United States. If you go to a dialysis center, if you go to a clinic, a hospital, we understand that you don't let the hospital decide if they did a good job or a bad job with your surgery or with your x-ray. Uh, we need to use the skills of quality assurance, quality improvement, and independence uh, in figuring out whether or not healthcare is adequate. For some reason, for a lot of reasons we all know that are complicated, for decades we've decided to carve out healthcare behind bars and say, we're going to let sheriffs, commissioners of corrections, people who run the, these boxes we put people in, we'll let them decide if it's good enough and if it's the appropriate scope of services. So we get what we should expect, which is lots of jail and prison attributable deaths because we don't have independent oversight. Thank you so much, Mr. Venters, and to all our panelists. Thank you, Madam Chair. I yield back. Thank you so very much for your questioning, and thank you for raising ICE. I think we know that we've seen some terrible articles recently on the conditions there, and I think we will uh, be, uh, from the perspective of detention facilities, be looking at that. Uh, and again, thank you.